Well, friends, our scripture lesson today is taken from the gospel according to Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Well, this is one of the most controversial stories that you'll see in Scripture. It's really confusing. And, um, you know, one thing that I thought about is this. It's kind of odd. I'll get to how the connection is made. But every four years in the Winter Olympics, I think I've mentioned that one of the sports I like to watch is curling. I don't know why I find it fascinating. I just find it fascinating to watch the little stone go down the ice and the people sweeping madly to try and direct the direction and speed of the stone with their sweeping. They're yelling like crazy, and you have to kind of rely on the announcers because they don't show even the entire match. Because apparently a full curling match takes like three hours. Okay, there's a lot of con- consultation time. Uh, they, they yell at each other about what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and, and so it's really complicated. And so I, I do love watching them sweep madly as the stone creeps down. But I have one basic problem in my appreciation of the sport, which is that I don't actually know how you win. Right? So, uh, so I like watching them do it. But like, I don't even know, like, the equi- like how many turns you get, <laughs> all right? Well, it would be like watching a baseball game and saying, yeah, I only watch highlights. I don't even know, like, how many innings there are, all right? And so that's kind of how I watch curling. And it makes it kind of interesting to watch a sport where I don't know how to win. Now, how does that tie into the story? ties into this story because of, an, of, of a misunderstanding of what the win is. All right? See, what we have here is Jesus telling a story to his disciples. Remember, one of the things I always mention in reading a story in Scripture is a reminder of who is the audience. Is Jesus talking to people who are opposed to him, you know, opposition religious leaders? Is he talking to his followers or is he talking to the crowds? Okay, because you address those three audiences very differently. So always pay attention when reading a a story that Jesus tells to who he's talking to. All right, in this case, he's talking to his disciples. So his audience is his devoted followers, all right? the ones whom whom he's called, and he decides to tell them this story. And it begins with a rich man who has a manager, you know, in charge of his properties, and charges are brought to him, 
that the man is squandering his property. Now, this word squandering is the same word that, that appears in the story of the prodigal son, the son who gets his share of the inheritance and goes away and squanders his inheritance. All right? The implication in the word squandering is that there is immoral living involved. Or, okay? And so he's living in a way that is immoral. He's living in a way that, that is not proper. So he's not just wasting the master's money, he's wasting it in a particular kind of way. I mean, just like, you know, we would see the, the difference between someone who, who maybe um, took money to buy a really nice car versus someone who took money and blew it, you know, in, in casinos or at bars, stuff like that, right? We would see a little bit of, a little bit of a difference in, in how they did that. And, um, and here, the, the issue is this immorality that's implied in what the person is doing with the money. So the, the rich man, the master, goes to this person and says, what is this that I hear about you? Okay. Based on what he's heard, he's already decided to fire him. He says, give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. But one thing that's pretty subtle in here that, that I want to um, mention, because in, the, in this particular translation that we use of, of the Bible, there's a very subtle thing in the language that's used which I think starts to change the way we understand the story. And it doesn't appear in a lot of other English translations. It's where he says, give me an accounting of your management. When we hear that word accounting, give me an accounting, I start to think Excel spreadsheet. Okay? I want, show me the P&L right, of, of what you've been doing. But actually, the, the word is more generic than that. And you see other translations, like if you compare it to the New International Version that a lot of people use, it, the word they use is account, not accounting. Give me an account of your management. And if someone says, give me an account of what you've been doing, you don't necessarily just think the bottom line budget, all right? You start to think more narratively. You know, give me an accounting of your day, and it might be like, I spent this much on breakfast, I spent this much on lunch, I spent this much on gas. Give me an account of your day, starts to be more like, I had breakfast, I had, you know, that kind of thing. And so this, this difference in the word uh, really does shade the way we hear the story. All right. And the word account is probably closer to the Greek word that's involved here than accounting, because the word in the Greek is not a specifically financial term. All right? it, it, it's basically, tell me what you've been doing. Tell me how you've been managing my property. It, 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 uh, the word in the Greek might um, be more like a reckoning. Okay? Give me a reckoning of, what, of what's been going on. So in any case, the manager knows that it's not looking good for him. All right, the, the, the boss has already basically said, you can't be my manager anymore. And so he's going to lose his job. Right? And, and so what he does is the reason why companies today, when they fire people, they send a security guard with you to take you straight to your office and escort you to the door. All right? Rather than leave, the, you know, they don't say, hey, you're being terminated Friday. Stick around for a week, <laughs> okay? Uh, because they're afraid that their employee is going to do basically what this guy does. And this guy says, all right, well, I've decided what to do. I'm going to get fired. So what I want is for people to welcome me into their homes, which is actually a very interesting approach, right? He says that people may welcome me into their homes. He didn't pocket money which he probably could have done, all right? He probably could have just taken money that he was in charge of, because he's still in charge of it, and, and, just, and just pocket cash. But instead of doing that, what happens in this moment is that he realizes that what he's going to need after he loses his job is not money, it's people. All right. And the way he was living was not people-centered before. He was just blowing the money, probably in a somewhat hedonistic fashion. All right? But in this moment, he realizes that what he's going to need for his security moving forward is people, not money. And so what he does is he summons the debtors, all right, and he says, how much do you owe my master? And the person says, 100 jugs of olive oil. Now, see, he, he could have said, look, 
if you bring me 10 jugs today, we'll reduce your debt by 20. Right? And he could have taken the money that way. He doesn't do that, right? He just reduces the debts. He isn't trying to bring in cash. He just reduces the debts. And, and these are massive debts, by the way. All right? This is beyond like Costco size. All right? like, when I think of a jug of olive oil, right, I'm thinking Costco. All right? This is not that. This is how massive the quantities are. A hundred jugs of olive oil is about 600 gallons. All right? A hundred containers of wheat is about 33 tons. All right? The issue is that these are commercial debts. And the way they would have been accrued is that uh, the owner, the rich man presumably owns all this land is, and has tenant farmers. And the way rents were typically assessed against tenant farmers was in a quantity of harvest whether you made it or not, all right? And so if you, earned, if you owned a certain amount of land and you were growing olives on it, you were going to get olive oil from it, they might say, okay, your rent is 10 jugs, you know, 60 gallons of olive oil a year. That's your rent. And if you had a terrible year and you only generated 30 jugs, and it's like, okay, you paid it all, and you owed 30, and next year you owe 90. All right. And that's how these debts would snowball. All right. And it was an unfair system. And, so these, and that's an important part to remember when you get to later things. It wasn't a profit-sharing kind of deal. It wasn't like you get to farm the land and give me half. All right. It was fixed amounts. They were high amounts. It was easy for a farmer to not even be able to make that amount in a bad year, and that would simply cause the debt to accumulate even faster. Now, the manager says, take your bill, and we're just going to start lopping off huge amounts of this bill. And as the manager, the people presume that he has authority to do so. All right. Otherwise, it's not a legal reduction. Okay? So they presume that he's doing it because somehow the manager decided to be nice. And so we're going to do this. We're just going to cut all your, all your debts, and they presume he has authority. And when he says do it quickly, um, they, we, the presumption is that the people hearing this would have said, before my master changes his mind. You know, this deal is, you know... This is crazy. He's given away a ton here. You want to do this before he realizes what he's doing and changes his mind. So do it fast. Well, the manager finds out about it and goes up to the guy, and here's the shocker. He commended him. He commended him. He goes, good job. So it's because he had acted shrewdly which is a word that means, you know, like, just like it does in English. It means to act with insight. It meant to act with wisdom. You've shown real insight. You've shown real wisdom. You've learned something. And what he learned was the value of the relationships. All right? This was what, what, what he needed. That what he needed for his security was the goodwill of the people he was dealing with. He needed the relationships more than he needed the money. He acted shrewdly. He had, he had gained some insight in this process. He had gained some wisdom in this process. And the master commends him for it. And here's the thing. We're shocked by the story. Because we've always presumed that the owner's interest was the money. That's what we presume. That's why it's shocking. Because we read the story with this worldly presumption that what the owner would have wanted is to maximize his profits. We're shocked by the outcome of the story. But you see, what the story is teaching us is that that wasn't the aim. That wasn't the goal. See, the owner's not mad because the money wasn't the owner's first priority. I mean, 
Has this ever, this has happened to you at some times in your life, right? You've made a decision, something's happened, and you were like afraid to tell your parents or afraid to tell your boss, afraid to tell a friend, afraid to tell a partner because you thought they were going to be mad at you. And most of the time they are, but some of the time, <laughs> they're, you know, some of the time they're not. And you tell them, and they're like, oh, okay. And you're like, what? I, I, I thought you were going to be furious with me. I thought you were going to be furious about that. All right. You know. Kind of like the thing that, you know, the thing that we kind of expect would be the case, but it's still surprising that when I was 16 years old, all right, I had only had my driver's license in Illinois for a little bit of time. You get a full license in Illinois at 16. And, 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 and I rear-ended a car, all right? And my dad gave the, what you now know as a grown-up is going to be the response, which was, were you hurt? Was anyone hurt? And my answer was no. And he's like, okay, I'll come get you. We'll go get the car towed later. Don't worry about it. Right? And I had thought he was going to be so mad that I had had an accident with the car. And then you realize in that moment that he had the proper response. Nobody was hurt. It's okay. We'll talk about your driving skills later. <laughs> you know. And it reveals to you that there was a different priority system at work than you thought there was going to be. And the story, which remember is a story that Jesus is telling to his followers. He's not telling the story to a larger crowd. He's telling this story to his inner circle of followers, his disciples, to reveal a different priority system that God has. See, there's a transition here within the story to where Jesus is clearly now in the voice of Jesus talking to the disciples rather than the master in the parable talking to the manager because he's now in the plural. I tell you, make friends for yourselves, plural, okay? If it's the rich man, if we're still in the rich man's voice talking to the, the manager, right, it would have been singular, okay? Instead, this is now Jesus explaining the parable to his disciples saying, I tell you, make friends to, for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. The dishonest, which also means unjust, a reflection of that system that's referenced in the story that allowed such massive debts to be accumulated. He's like, I tell you, don't use that to, for your profit. Make friends for yourselves. That this is what you do with wealth. You use it to build relationships. This is what matters. See, this is what defines faithful. See, if then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, and again, if you're still stuck in the mindset that says that the, manager's pri that the rich man's priority was maximizing his profits, you're sitting there saying, how was the manager faithful with the wealth? He wasn't faithful with the wealth. He gave it away capriciously. He just went up to people and said, take your bill and reduce it. Just write in a smaller number. How is that possibly faithful? It's still jarring because deep within us we're stuck on the notion that the issue was the prophet. Jesus is taking the story of this person who just gave away the rich man's property, curried favor with the debtors by doing so, and said, oh, 
That's faithful. This was faithful. I suggest that you only try this with Jesus because your bosses may not appreciate this <laughs> this, this definition of, of faithful. But I think what it means for us is that we need to rethink what it means to be faithful. We need to be rethinking for ourselves what faithful means. Right. Faithful. To be faithful right, is to bring honor to God. Right? Clearly, see, what, what the owner was interested in here, what the rich man was interested in here, was how the people felt about him. He was happy that the people then appreciated the generosity. All right? This was the actual thing that the, that the manager did that the rich man was grateful for. He looked great. He looked kind. He looked compassionate. He looked generous. And sometimes we may think that we are honoring God, but really the way we honor God is to inspire others to honor God. We honor God when we live in such a way that people see us as followers of Christ and think well of Christ. I mean, at the bottom line is, when you think about wealth, when you think about things that you have, everything's been entrusted to you by God. And then the question is, as we deploy what's been entrusted to us, has God's trust in you been vindicated? Are you a squanderer? Or have you been shrewd with it? Have you used it to build relationships? Right. Or would people look at what you do with what God has entrusted to you, and I'm not just talking about material wealth, what God has entrusted to you in terms of material wealth, in terms of skills, in terms of position, wherever you are, you know, whatever it is that you have in life that can be deployed, okay? If God has entrusted this to you, has God's trust in you been vindicated in how you've used it? Would people look at how you've used all of the gifts and talents and things that God has given you and said, God, good choice. Good choice. You gave talent, you gave whatever resource, you gave this, that, or the other, and you entrusted it to this person, and they are doing so well with it. Whether, they, whether you were entrusted with a lot or entrusted with a little, the question is, would, would people say, good choice? Or would people say, God, you need to fire that person. They're, they're embarrassing you. Their stewardship of what you've entrusted to them does not reflect well on you. See, our lives reflect on God. As followers of Christ, when we're kind, God seems kind. Right? The uptight legalism that some people practice in the name of, of their faith is not good. It doesn't present God in a kind light in a generous light, right? But when people say, you're a good manager, you're a good steward, right? you've taken what God has given you and used it well. It's both a win for God and a win for us. You can't play a game well if you don't know how to win. Right. Right. If I ever went curling, that'd be my first question. How do you actually win at this game? <laughs> and maybe 
sometimes we don't play life as well as we could because we haven't actually understood what the win is in the eyes of God. If we get that right, we'll do it better. And like this story, it may go against the preconceived notions that we've had of what it is God wants from us. Amen.